and let us pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you for your love and the sending forth of your beloved son, Jesus. And we thank you that you did so in the context of a dry and thirsty land, a land and an earth that was under your wrath and your curse because of sin and because of our rebellion and our turning our back on you, that while we were still enemies, you sent Jesus for us. We think of how it was in that, that same context, how um, we were happy to be living far away from you, and how we were eating of the feasts and the delights of this e present evil age, uh, and living in sin, which the wages, it only leads to, to death. But we thank you, Jesus, for your perfect righteousness. We thank you for the, the death and the forsakenness, uh, the, the dryness that you experienced on the cross. Um, even as we sing, uh, oh God, you are my God, we thank you how even at the cross and that forsakenness, because of the penalty of our sins and that wrath being placed upon you, how you cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We thank you how you continue to fix your eyes uh, on the hope, the joy that was set before you, and we thank you that you have overcome. We thank you for now, as you sit at the right hand of God the Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray as your word and as the gospel goes to the ends of the earth, uh, we pray that these rivers of living water, this river of living water, as you are the source of that water, uh, we pray that that water would cover the earth even as uh, the waters cover the sea. We pray that you would awaken us more to your glory. We pray that you would uh, give us a, a disgust and a, a disinterest more and more and the passing pleasures of sin. We pray that you would deliver us from the evil one, and we ask now that you would accept of our worship as we assemble to worship you in spirit and truth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And please be seated. And if you'd please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 7. We'll be reading from John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Again, we'll be looking at the the living water that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah as we're coming to chapters 43 and 44. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah will talk about rivers in the desert, waters in the wilderness, rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. I will pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. They will spring up like poplars by streams of water. And it's in that context then that uh, we'll be reading from John chapter 7. And uh, John's gospel, of course, has much to say about the Messiah. One of the reasons we call Jesus the Messiah or the Christ is because he is the anointed. And as the anointed, um, he is the one. And it's through his finished work that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. John's gospel begins with the greatest of the, the Old Testament prophets, John, John the Baptist, and he is preaching a repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and he was preaching that repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the river Jordan. So you have the, the biggest river uh, running through the promised land, the river Jordan, and the river Jordan uh, was showing how we need to be washed from our sin. But of course, it doesn't matter how much river, it's, whether it's in the River Jordan, you could take all of the lakes and the rivers of the world, uh, that can't wash away sin. It's only, and as John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus received baptism from John, uh, it wasn't because he needed to repent of his sin. Uh, he was identifying himself with us as uh, the substitute, the one who would bear the, the penalty for the sins of all who put their faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, the giving of the Spirit is mentioned in John chapter 3. And there is a Jewish man, a Pharisee, an older man by the name of Nicodemus. Jesus begins talking about the water and the Spirit and being born again, born from above, a, a reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 4, Jesus goes to a well that had been dug by Jacob. And uh, you're reading that if you're reading uh, the book of Genesis with us right now. And now he's sitting at Jacob's well, and there's a Samaritan woman. And there's sin that needs to be repented of. And that Samaritan woman finds life. 
You see the work of the Spirit through faith in Christ, and the whole village of the Samaritans comes to faith in Jesus. Now in John chapter 7, um, Jesus stands in, in, at the temple, and he says on the last and greatest day of the feast, and we'll begin reading in chapter 7 through verses 37 and through 39, and this is an invitation to all. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures sa scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke of the spirits whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, Jesus is now glorified at the right hand of God the Father, and you can come to him and find life. Pray that the Lord would give you a thirst for righteousness, a thirst for the Holy Spirit, a thirst for the power of the age to come. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 43. Be reading from Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 14 through chapter 44 and verse 8. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at God and how he has been bringing his case and his arguments, why he is God and why he is God alone. The crisis in Isaiah's day was Israel's unbelief and Israel's pending captivity in Babylon. Uh, the, the Davidic kingship, the old covenant Davidic kingship, uh, had failed. There would be no more temple. Uh, God's people would be in exile. And from all outward appearances and to all human understanding, it looked as if God and his word had failed. The reason for the Bapt Babylonian captivity, though, wasn't anything wrong with God. It was because his servant, his old covenant servant, did not trust in the Lord alone as her salvation. God was not their song. He was not their, their victory. And they had failed in their witness to the Lord. So God then brings his case, uh, the Hebrew word, or I'm sorry, the Greek word there uh, is logos, for he is bringing his case as Logos for being God alone. And God is now saying he is sovereign over all of the nations. He is sovereign over the Assyrians. He is sovereign over the Babylonians. He is sovereign over the captivity of Israel. And he will bring his people back from captivity through the Persians. And he even names Cyrus by name at the end of chapter 44 and the beginning of chapter 45, which we won't be reading from today. And Yahweh's greatest case for being God is his servant Jesus. And we looked at Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1 where the Lord says, Behold my servant. We've learned that Jesus is the servant of the Lord. Uh, he referred to himself by this title in the Gospels. This was proclaimed in the Apostolic Church. So in Isaiah chapter 42, there's a wonderful prophetic description of the servant Jesus, that the Lord, Yahweh's soul, delights in Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord would rest upon him, and that's what we'll be looking at today. We'll be looking at the Spirit of the Lord, how Jesus then would establish justice in the earth. You can think of how he's established justice in the earth uh, at the cross and how throughout the earth there's a, a peace with God. There's no condemnation for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. He would be a light to the nations. So it's not just for the Jews. It is for the Jews, of course. But it's also for the nations, a light to the nations, because the nations are living in darkness. He would open up blind eyes. He would bring prisoners from dungeons. We all, we've also been looking at our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at our identity as those who are precious and honored and loved. In a Bible study on Thursday, we looked at uh, part of our identity where the Lord says, you are my witnesses. And we talked about the importance of being faithful witnesses to the gospel and gave some practical ways through the Romans road how you can share your faith with others and show them, again, it's the Holy Spirit that has to open their eyes, but show them from the scriptures uh, why they need to be trusting in Jesus and how they can do that by putting their faith and trust in him. So today the sermon title is Belonging to the Lord. And we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 14 through chapter 44 and verse 8. Hear the living word of the living God. 
Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I have sent to Babylon and will bring them all down as fugitives, even the Chaldeans, into the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty man, They will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought to me the sheep of your burnt offerings, nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings, nor wearied you with incense. You have Bought me not sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue our case together. State your case that you may be proved right. Your first forefather sinned and your spokesmen have transgressed against me. So I will pollute the prince, princes of the sanctuary and will consign Jacob to the ban and Israel to revilement. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and you, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's, and that one will call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name, with honor. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yet, yes, let him account to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock? I know of none. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you as you are the King of Israel. And we come before you, Jesus, as the Redeemer. We pray and thank you for your finished work, Jesus. We thank you for the great work and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would give us a, a growing sense of our need for uh, the, the work, the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. We need your Spirit in order to understand your Word. We need your Spirit in order even to desire your Word. And I pray that your Spirit would be applying to your Word to each and every one of our lives our own consciences and those things that we need to hear uh, so that we might be better disciples and followers of you, Jesus Christ, as your witnesses. But we pray for the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit for those who are still dead in their transgressions and sins and under the power of this present evil age. We ask for your mighty word and that you would deliver them and translate them into the kingdom of your glorious Son. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. So the context of our passage here in Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus, so that makes it about 2,700 years ago for us today, 
as I, um, Isaiah is prophesying, because Judah is on the way to exile in Babylon. So another nation is going to come that is stronger uh, than Israel, and they are going to take into captivity uh, that people, and they are going to re relocate them. They are going to poke the eyes of the last king out, Zedekiah, um, and they will judge Zedekiah and his sons. There will be no more temple, and it seems like the promises and the seed of Israel will be gone forever. And, of course, this uh, being on the way to exile is how Isaiah 39 ended. You remember in Isaiah chapter 39 when Hezekiah, one of the sons of David, he was one of the kings of Jerusalem, he showed all of his treasures to the Babylonians, not giving glory to the Lord. Uh, the prophet Isaiah sent to Hezekiah, says, what is this you have done? Um, he says, yeah, I, I did show him all my glory. I didn't apparently tell him about the glory of the Lord and the, the coming Messiah. And so Isaiah says, your sons... Uh, your treasures will be carried to Babylon, and your sons will be taken away and become officials in the palaces of Babylon. And Hezekiah kind of says, whew, well, at least that's not going to be in my generation. It would be a little bit more than 100 years after Hezekiah. So now we are in a section of comfort. So, uh, and comfort was needed. And there's much comfort in the coming judgment in Babylon, this exile, and God's restoration. So you remember how Isaiah 40 begins after Hezekiah, not seemingly caring about the descendants uh, and the nation after him. Uh, Isaiah is sent, and um, it is written, Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So here's the promise of the coming Messiah. This hadn't happened. They were still on their way to Babylon. And then we have in verse 3 of Isaiah 40, a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. So that's the, the ministry of John the Baptist. So we are, we are being taken through the ages of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, uh, to the age of Messiah and the day of salvation in which we now live. So the comfort is that there's a coming king, a son of David, who is greater than Hezekiah, that would care about the generations after. He would care more about his people than he cared about his own physical life and his own earthly treasures. Uh, Jesus didn't have any earthly treasures, so to speak. Uh, he didn't even have any place to, to rest his head. Uh, and he did this out of love for his people. And the coming Messiah would make a new covenant and it would be a covenant that would not be broken because he is the keeper of that covenant. So you have this covenant being broken in Isaiah's day, but there's this hope of the new covenant that we now live in. So with that overall context, I want you to look with me at Isaiah chapter 43 and verses 14 through 17. So I'd like to look uh, at some of the verses here um, briefly, and then we'll be looking at the bigger picture and making application of this to our lives. So initially, um, this may not seem like it's very relevant to you because this happened so long ago, but it is of the, the greatest relevance for, for you and for me, for our children, and for uh, the generation in which we live. So looking at uh, our text here in Isaiah 43, in verses 14 through 17, uh, God says, uh, I am sending you to Babylon. So this is a, a discipline, it's, it's a judgment, um, however, in these verses, there's always a hope of a redeemer. So you have judgment, but there's this hope of, of salvation. So God will exile Israel, and this did happen. Uh, he will exile Israel to Babylon. But God says, I will judge Babylon, and I will bring my people back from exile. And note the language of the Exodus in verses 14 through 17. And again, this will be the next book that we read as a congregation when we finish Genesis our, for next month, and after that we'll be looking at the book of Exodus. So look with me at verses 14 through 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon, and I will bring them all down as fugitives. So God will judge the, Babyloni the Babylonians. Then he says in verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One. That reminds us of the exodus and the burning bush when the Lord appeared to, to Moses 
um, in Exodus chapter 3 before delivering his people from slavery. Just as God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt in Exodus, now God is saying, I'm going to deliver you from exile in Babylon. Uh, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the, crea the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea. Well, th there's the Red Sea. We've been singing about that. We sang about it in Psalm 118. God is able to make a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and the horse. So you remember how the, the Pharaoh's army that was defeated in the waters, God will bring about this same thing with the defeat of the Babylonians. They will lie down together, not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. So that's the, the end of the Babylonian um, empire, <clears throat> and therefore the beginning of the return from exile. Now if you look with me at verses 18 through 21, God is saying in these verses that he is going to do something new. New is a key word. New is related in the scriptures to things like new covenant or new creation. Isaiah will speak later about a new heavens and a new earth. A new redemption is going to happen here. A new, a renewed humanity. That's why we must be born again. We, uh, there's a, 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 there is a new self, a new heart that we must receive. There will be a new Jerusalem. There will be uh, this work of Messiah. So this, look with me. This is the meaning of verses 18 through 21. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Why? Because I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? So there's something new. God began anew in Genesis 12 with Abraham, you remember, in our study of Genesis. God's going to do something new that goes back before Abraham and the beginning of the Israelite nation. God is going to do something new that goes back before Adam. He's going to do something that goes back even before the creation of the heavens. This is part of his plan that he is going to be bringing about for all of the earth. What is going, God going to do in verse 19? I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness. So we've been singing about the wilderness in Psalm 63. Rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me. The jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to drink, to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. So the rivers in the desert here are reference to the work of Messiah, the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. So remember that in the Old Covenant, when God redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt, he provided on their way to Mount Sinai and through the wilderness, God provided water from rocks for his people. So there, there is no water, but that's not a problem for the creator of the heavens and the earth. So there's the striking, the speaking to the rock, and God provided for the needs of his people. Now we're in the wilderness again. But what God is saying through Isaiah is that there will be rivers now in the desert for a new or a renewed people whom he has chosen and formed for himself to declare his praise. So the mention here in these verses of beasts and jackals and ostriches calls to, uh, to mind Isaiah chapter 11 and the work of the Spirit. It calls to mind the wolf dwelling with the lamb, the cow and the bear grazing together. Now if you look with me at verses 22 through 24 of Isaiah 43, God makes clear here that he's talking about a new covenant. It's not like the old covenant in this sense. Old Testament, Old Covenant Israel always failed. They couldn't keep the covenant. They, they said in Exodus 24 at Mount Sinai, everything that the Lord has said we will do. But the whole story of Israel, they didn't do it. That's why they're on the way to Babylon. But there's going to be someone new. There's going to be someone that God sends, God's servant. And what will be new is that the covenant will be fulfilled. The covenant, the penalties of the covenant would be taken upon this servant, as we'll learn in Isaiah 53. But the righteous requirements of the covenant would be kept through the obedience of Jesus. 
So look with me at verses 22 through 24 of Isaiah 43. Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob. This is old covenant Israel, right? Genesis 4, remember after Adam and Eve sinned, men began to call on the name of the Lord. God chose Abraham and his seed in the old covenant to call on his name. What are they doing? They're not calling on his name. And look at this. You have become weary of me, O Israel. We're tired of God. If you're tired of God, this is why you need the Spirit. We'll talk about that more. But this is, this is an Isaiah's day. Look at what the people are doing. You, you have not brought me the sheep, uh, sheep of your burnt offerings. <coughs> Excuse me. Nor have you honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings, nor wearied you with incense. I haven't given you too much. <laughs> but you have brought me no sweet cane with money, nor have you filled me with the fat of your sacrifices. Rather, you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. You see, God is merciful and compassionate. He puts away transgression and sin. It's transgression and sin that led all of humanity into exile in the first place. That, that's why there's death in the world today. Everyone's asking, what's wrong with the world? You know, there's so much wickedness and evil in it. And you don't have to look far. It's also within you and, and, and in me. But what God is, is saying is that you're, you're, you're wearying me. You're not repenting. You're not turning to that mercy and compassionate. So you're, God is a burden to Israel. Sin, idolatry, immorality. That was their delight. God is a burden who forgives transgressions. Oh, that's too much for me. I, I'm sick of that. I'm weary. What, what, make, what gives me pleasure and joy? I mean, you have to look at your own heart, your own conscience. This is why he's, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Yeah. God burdens me. I, I love my sin. See, Old Covenant and Israel had left their first love. And like Adam and Eve, when they were kicked out of the garden of paradise, now, they're, now Israel is going to be kicked out of the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. So you look with me at verse 27. There's much discussion here of who Israel's first forefather was. So God says, here's my case. None of you has kept my covenant. And he goes all the way back, and I'm going to argue here in verse 27, your first forefather sinned. And there's a lot of discussion. Who is this first forefather of Israel? Is it Abraham? Is it Isaac? Is it Jacob? Or is it Adam? Now, there is an agreement, but my understanding is that the first uh, forefather here is it's Adam. All of humanity. Not just going back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, although they too needed a redeemer and a savior. All of humanity going back to Adam have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the connection is clear as you look at the larger context. Adam was driven from paradise because of his sin. That, that, that's why we live in a, a fallen, sin-cursed world. Israel, though, in Abraham's day, right, there's a promise of land. And that land flowing with milk and honey was a type of paradise. It was a type of paradise restored. But, but now, Israel, going all the way back, and it, it, it's, it's all of the kings, it's, it's the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it, all, it goes all the way back to all of humanity. This isn't just a Jewish problem. That, that's, Isaiah isn't just saying it's just the Jews that have this problem of sin and living in a fallen, sin-cursed world and the, the sin within them and their idolatry and their immorality. No, it's not just a Jewish problem. It's a problem with all of humanity. And, and now Israel, who is supposed to be a light for the nations, now they have fallen into the same immor immorality and idolatry that they were supposed to be saved from when God delivered them from slavery in Egypt. So looking at verse 27, your, for, your first forefather sinned, and your spokesmen have transgressed against me. So even after that, and that would include, of course, the patriarchs, the judges, and the kings, and the prophets, and the priests. So what is God going to do in verse 28? Uh, I will pollute the princes of the sanctuary, and I will consign Jacob to the ban and Israel to revilement. That's the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the ban is what the Canaanites were placed under in the days of the judges and Joshua. Remember when Joshua goes in, uh, the, the Canaanites were placed on that ban, and they were driven from the land. And now the Israelites, they're, they're sinning the same way, right? And now they're being driven from the land. The wages of sin is death, um, and it, but we'll be looking at uh, the gift of God. 
Now, as we come to Isaiah chapter 44, even though Israel was on their way to the Babylonian exile, God is promising now a return. But it's not just a return for ethnic Israel. Now Isaiah is beginning to talk about a return from exile for all of humanity. God is promising here a new creation, a greater redemption that is for both Jews and Gentiles. There would be, in other words, another forefather, another forefather, another Adam, a second Adam, one whom we already have learned about in Isaiah 9, 6. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The first forefather sinned. There will be another forefather, a new humanity, and a humanity that doesn't end in death and curse. If you are in the first Adam, you are under the wrath of God. But there would be another coming, and this one would bring life. And this is for both Jews and Gentiles. If I be lifted up, Jesus says in John's gospel, and that's the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Not just the Jews. Yes, indeed the Jews. But also the ends of the earth. For God so loved the world. Right? It's not just the Jews that he loved. John 3, yes, he loves the Jews. John 3, that's the Pharisee Nicodemus. John 4, it's the Samaritans. But he loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This world that loves sin. This world that loves death. This world that loves uh, immorality. God the Father gave his son in that context. And of course, when Jesus died on the cross, what happens? The veil in the temple tears from top to bottom. The way back into the blessed presence of God for Jew and Gentile is through faith in Jesus. Adam's sin brought a curse on all humanity. And now Israel's sin in Isaiah's day is bringing a curse on their own nation. But now God is saying, I will bring you back. And Isaiah 44 now speaks of Messiah's work and the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit as good news that is for all people. And there will be a new covenant, a new Israel that is born from above. That's why we read from John's gospel. Jesus stands and he, he offers the very things that Isaiah is prophesying about. He offers to all who come to him. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What an amazing change the Lord Jesus brings about in the life and the hearts of those who put their faith and trust in him. Because you know outside of Christ, Jesus taught in Matthew 15, for from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, immorality, greed, lewdness, and all other sorts of filth from within it. But there would be a work of Jesus as such, the work of the Holy Spirit, that from our innermost being in Christ will flow this living water. And so here in our text, then, is the emphasis of Christ's work, the age in which we now live, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look with me at verse um, 3 of, <clears throat> of the pouring forth of uh, the Holy Spirit uh, upon all flesh. So you look at Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. That's, that's Pentecost. That's exactly what Joel was saying in the last days. God would pour out what? The Holy Spirit on all flesh. So in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and now the Spirit of God is being poured forth. For Jerusalem, it's for Jews. For Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it's a, a beautiful way of looking at, again, rivers in the desert, going back to Isaiah 43 and verse 19. These, these are images of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in the scriptures are often 
uh, connected to water. Even in Genesis 1 and 2, you see the Spirit of God hovering over the water. You think of Jesus' baptism, the River Jordan, the Spirit of God then descending upon Jesus as a dove. Rivers in the desert. So the desert again, there's, it's, it's, it's a metaphor, but there's, life, there's no life in the desert. It's dead. You know, that, that's why we pray that we live in a dry and thirsty land. You say, well, well, you look around and there's sin galore. Yeah, that's the wilderness. That, that's the problem within us too. But there is a different kind of water that God is pouring out on the land. Streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. They will spring up like poplars by streams of water. It reminds us, uh, the streams by water reminds us, doesn't it, uh, of Psalm 1, the blessed man. Now, you may remember that a river flowed out of Eden. Remember that river. So as we're, we're thinking about rivers here, this goes all the way back to Eden and that the river that flowed from Eden and it divided into four rivers. The book of Revelation ends on the same note, doesn't it? John is shown on the Lord's Day in Revelation 22, a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the image of the Holy Spirit. Even in the new heavens, there's the work of the Holy Spirit. In the middle of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. No more wilderness, no more deserts. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. There's the servant of the Lord, what he would accomplish, and then there's the bond servants serving the triune God. So the Holy Spirit, the river of the water of life, it is the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit who can enable us to serve the Lord from the heart because only the Holy Spirit can bring about a change in our heart and write the law of God on our hearts. In the Old Covenant, the law of God was written on the tablets of stone. But the prophets, whether it's Ezekiel, whether it's Jeremiah, and now Isaiah is now seeing a work of the new covenant in which God's people are sick and tired of the Lord and of his law. This is boring. No longer. No, that's, that's wilderness. God will bring streams of living water. And notice that the, the response here. So last week we looked at our identity in Christ, how you are precious in Christ. You are honored. You are loved. That's good news, isn't it? And how do the redeemed respond to God's love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ? Look with me at verse 5 of our text. This one will say, I am the Lord's. I am Yahweh's. I belong to the Lord. I want to belong to the Lord. That one will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name with honor. This is the work flowing from the cross of Jesus, and now the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. So look with me. You have there Isaiah 44 and verse 5. Contrast that with Old Covenant Israel in Isaiah 43 and verse 22, which we just looked at, or earlier looked at. Isaiah 43 and verse 22, Old Covenant Israel, the Old Covenant servant of the, of the Lord, yet you have not called on me, O Jacob, but you have become weary with me, O Israel. But now there is a new work that the Lord is doing in which not just ethnic Israel is proud, honored to be called an Israelite or a descendant of Jacob. But now you have the beginning of the nations, the Gentiles, who are proud in the best and most worshipful sense of the term pride, right? That, that's, we're, we're exalting God alone, not ourselves. But we are honored to be the Lord's, to be known as the Israel of God, and to call upon his name. In Isaiah's day, the Jews were ashamed of that name. They were ashamed of the name Jew. Think of Ahaz, <laughs> a king, the king, the son of David, saying to a pagan king, I am your servant. I am your son. He turns his back on his sonship 
and all of the promises of God in that covenant. That's old covenant Israel. But there will be a new son, another son, the eternal son of God, who would be faithful. And one of the reasons we know that these are not just Jews who are now the descendants of Jacob through faith and the descendants of Israel, it's because what are they doing? They're writing on their hand, what? <laughs> Belonging to the Lord. Now, this is a metaphor, but it's a very important metaphor. But you know this is Gentiles because tattoos or writing on the hand was forbidden to the nation of Israel because of its association with paganism. And you can think of that throughout history. But now the Gentiles, who haven't been marked in the flesh through circumcision, now they have been given the name, right, through the Spirit of God, they've been given that spirit a love for the God of Abraham, a love for the God of Isaac, a love for the God of Jacob. Because the Spirit of God has written the same law on the heart of both Jew and Gentile through faith in Jesus the Christ. This is a personal confession. I belong to the Lord. It's, it's like Jacob, you remember, wrestling with God. Jacob saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. I belong to the Lord. The Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit can work in your life so that you say, I want from the heart to serve the Lord. I want from the heart to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. I want from the heart to obey the Lord with a total surrender, without any reservation. Do you love God from the heart? Is this descriptive of you? Think back to the mark on the hand in our text, belonging to the Lord. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, isn't it? You remember in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is the giving of the Ten Commandments? In Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the first great commandment, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Only God can do that, by the way. You can't write these things on your heart. God must, the Holy Spirit must do this. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. Right now, the, the offspring of Israel in our text, now the, they're being taught these things. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Belonging to the Lord. The, the belonging to the Lord, we still mark our hands in different ways, don't we? What's this? If you've ever seen an engaged couple or you look at Facebook pictures, you know, what, what are the pictures? Look at my new ring. You see a, a, a mar you know, wedding pictures. What are you looking at? There's, not everyone does this, but we do, we do this in their culture. And what are you saying with your hand that's marked? I belong to Heidi. I'm proud of that in the Lord. I, th th this, this is what Israel is now doing, the new Israel of God, saying, I belong to the Lord. There's no shame in it. We don't have to hide this covenant. There's a problem if you start hiding the covenant in different ways, isn't there? And it's the same problem in Isaiah's day. Think of Hosea, a contemporary of Isaiah. Gomer wasn't proud to belong to the Lord. She wasn't proud to belong to Hosea. And that was a picture of old covenant Israel's shame. Shame for belonging to the Lord. But there would be a work of Christ in which both Jews and Gentiles would say, I belong to the Lord. Body, soul, spirit. I love the Lord. And it's his grace. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm asking you, is this your experience? I remember, and if it's not your experience, what do you do? You need to pray to the Lord and that he would grant you his Holy Spirit, and that he would allow you to hunger and thirst for Christ. That you, one of the worst things Jesus could say to a believer, right? You have left your first love. You don't love me anymore. 
you, I'm, you're tired of me. You're more excited about the, the, whatever's going on in the world, your own flesh. That's a problem. And if you're struggling with that, what do you do? God, will you help me not to quench the Holy Spirit? God, will you help give me eyes so that I see your glory? And, and will you help me? Will you give me that heart to love you as you have loved me? Jesus, Jesus loves us. He gave everything. Jesus, will you help me to love you? I'm growing tired. I'm growing weary. I'm finding these birth. That's okay. This is what Jesus says. If you are lacking in these things, pray, and he will give you the Holy Spirit. This is the great gift of God. I remember when I was a, a young boy, and I, I've told you stories when I was younger, and there were different periods of my life, but my parents would make me go to church, right? Some periods of my life I wanted to go to church, other periods of my life I just wanted to decide for myself. And I don't remember the exact age. I was thinking about this. Maybe I could talk to my um, parents, my uh, brothers about this. I haven't yet. But there came a point when I was about 12, and we went to a church, and it was a small church. There weren't other, really many other kids our age. And... Um, I remember that one of the boys, um, I'll just give the name of the, the first names. Of, well, I won't give their names at all. But uh, one of the boys, who is a couple years older than me, maybe I was 12, I don't know if he was 14, and he's no longer coming to church. I'm like, you know, why isn't so-and-so coming to church anymore, mom and dad? Well, his parents say that he's old enough to decide for himself, and he doesn't want to come to church anymore. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I'm 12. I don't want to go to church anymore, mom and dad. And they're like, no, that, that's not what our household does. Nice try, Aaron. Uh, what, what, what? He's a young man. He's making his own decisions. Uh, yeah, but that's not what we decide. And uh, maybe you're at that point in your life, right? I, I was at that point. What should you do if you find God boring? You find his law boring or you're ashamed of your baptism. You're ashamed of your family's association with Christianity. Ask for the Holy Spirit. This is, this is what we're saying in Psalm 63. God, Jesus, I need the, the, the living waters within to flow from within me. I, I, I can't do this in my own strength. You know what my own strength looks like, God. I wouldn't be here if it were up to me. But will you grant me your spirit? Will you give me a hunger and a thirst for his righteousness? And he'll answer that prayer. He's answered that prayer for me. And he's still answering that prayer for me. Because it, it's like, you're, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle. I, I sing Psalm 63 a lot when I wake up early in the morning. And I, I'm like, God, I'd rather be sleeping. God, I'd rather be, you know, God, will you give me that living water? Will you give me a, a, a love for your people? Will you give me a love and an urgency for those who are dying in their transgressions and sins? Will you renew Give me your, your Holy Spirit afresh and anew so that I have a new love, a renewed love for the nations that I would really care that tens of thousands of people are dying every hour. They're dying in their sin and their transgression. And you have called me to be a witness. Will you give me a love for that and a desire? Will you give that to your people? Make, these your prayer, make this your personal prayer. You, I can't pray. I can't give you the Holy Spirit. No one can do this. You must ask for yourself. I pray that you would ask. I pray that the Lord would awaken you. But you need to personally ask, God, will you deliver me from my, my love for, for sin and all of its shame? Will you forgive me for being ashamed for that covenant? And I want to hide that hand. No. God, will you help me to raise my hand? And there are many Psalms, aren't there, about lifting the hand to the Lord, right? That, that's what it is. Lord, I love you and I'm not ashamed of you. Will you give me that love for you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make that your prayer. I, pray, I will pray that right now. But you need to make these your prayers. You need to make the Psalms of Jacob and Israel your Psalms and say, oh God, you are my God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that that was your confession, Jesus, from the cross. My God. And it was a confession that you made even in the context of our depravity, the pollution, and the ugliness, and the disgustingness, the shame of our sin. And as you bore that shame, as you bore that penalty, we thank you that you did that out of love. We thank you, Father, that you sent your Son for that purpose. 
and we thank you for the age in which we live and the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for teaching us that we are to be asking and seeking and knocking. And, oh, Lord, will you, through your Spirit, awaken within us that sense that we need to be asking and seeking and knocking. And we thank you, Father, that you are a Father that loves and knows how to give good gifts, the heavenly gift, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit to your children and to all those who ask. So we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.